I'm doing these more and more, these YouTube live streams. Uh, people seem to enjoy them. Um, I think I'm going to operate most of them separately uh, so that, you know, they don't automatically become podcasts, but some of them do. Some of them uh, make a, you know, pretty good foundation for like a radio podcast, and so I'll release the audio to Blog Talk Radio, but uh, mostly it's a chance to just spend a little time, hang out. It's a good break for me from the production room. I have uh, been quite busy. i got a show coming up on Tuesday where we talk about the church, crimes, and the Constitution. I'm going to talk with Andrew Torres from the Opening Arguments podcast about the huge mess that we're in here in the United States, um, religiously, politically, theocratically, and it's just uh, it's, it's nuts. I'm uh, preparing the advertising campaign for Ghost Stories. The audiobook releases in September. And uh, so, by the way, all the super chats that uh, you you donate, or if you want to donate through the website uh, at thethinkingatheist.com or become a patron, right now I'm focusing on trying to you know, stockpile a little bit of extra cash to try to get the word out. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to find a new audience. I'm excited for people who show up for the ghost stories, who then go, hey, wait a minute, what is the thinking atheist? And then maybe they become podcast listeners, and maybe they start engaging, and maybe before you know it, uh, you know, we've got uh, a whole new section of people, you know, demographic of people who... Um, you know, they came for one thing, but they stayed for the rest. So anyway, if you uh, if you donate to the Super Chat, that really helps. But beyond that, I'm just glad you're watching, and uh, I'll do my best to try to you know give you a compelling exchange here in uh, response to the chat. I think the chat's up on screen. Yeah, there it is. And what I didn't realize at the time is it also, I think, scrolls on the YouTube um, playback page. But uh, hell, I'll leave it on the screen anyway, depending on what platform you're watching on. Uh, looks like I've got, um, James said, I'm a skeptic, but I think I have a good reason why God is real. Hit me, James. I sense a punchline coming to a joke. Um, I've got, oh, hey, how you doing, DLJ from Malaysia? Malaysia? Um, so anyway, I'm uh, going to try to sort of jump over, but if you have a comment or question in the chat, uh, now's the time to do it, so... Um, what else was going on? Oh, I'm still waiting on the ice cream man. I think he's due about, about two hours. I still haven't caught him. It's just pathetic. 50 year old man. I'm bounding down the stairs, running out the front door and he's off going. And you know, like I'm hoping he'll look in the rear view mirror. I must look absolutely ridiculous out there. And it's become a great story at the house, you know, because it's just stupid. It's, oh, Seth wants a bomb pop, you know. Seth um, has just been trying to catch this guy. So, um, anyway, um, uh, let's see. There was something else I was going to um, I was going to mention. I'm going to be on the road in September. I've actually taken some time off, and um, so I'm going to Milwaukee on the eighth of September for a special event. I'm going to be doing two dates in Chicago on September the 9th. That's going to be big fun. I've got Minneapolis-St. Paul on the roster for Sunday, September the 23rd. The second weekend in November, I'm doing two dates in Florida. I'm going to be in Orlando. Let's see. I'm on Orlando on Sunday, and the Saturday before, I will be in Clearwater at a very cool place called the Octagon. And it's got a stage that's on the floor level. And then they've got this big seating area that just goes up all the way around eight sides. And it's part of the uh, Unitarian Universalist Church of Clearwater. I spoke there years ago. And I remember thinking, this is a badass auditorium. And uh, so that's that's on the roster. And there's a slight chance, a slight chance, actually more than slight, that I'm going to be traveling to the Netherlands. That'll be on November the 3rd. And uh, so, I mean, I've never had the opportunity to go there, but apparently a convention is taking place, and I am a potential speaker. I mean, they sort of tapped me on the shoulder via email and said, would you like to be on the schedule? And, of course, I was looking around going, God, that's a long way to go. I mean, is it really worth it for you guys to drag me all the way up there? And um, 
they're very enthusiastic. So it might be a chance for me to go and meet some people on the other side of the world. And uh, so keep your eyes and ears open. I'll update the event pages just as soon as I get the confirmations on all this stuff at um, thethinkingatheist.com slash events. And that I'm also trying to keep it updated on my personal website, sethandrews.net. Uh, let's see. Hablando says, how would you how would you deal with my atheism when you are surrounded by Catholicism? And of course I am disabled. I'm surrounded by Christianity. You know, when Muhammad El Khadra was in Jordan, he was surrounded by Islam. I think we're all surrounded by superstition and irrationality beyond the religious belief. I know it's frustrating. Um but if possible, I think being loud and proud, just being out as a secular person is where we start and, uh, and treat people like human beings. What's the best way to try to start an atheist group or free thinkers club at my college? Julia, thanks for the message. Go to secularstudents.org. They have whole kits that are designed for people who want to start secular groups at their high schools or at their universities. They are great at this. They are crazy organized. And uh, they can give you the resources that you need. Secularstudents.org. It's the Secular Student Alliance. Jared has donated 500. What's NOK? Forgive me, I'm totally ignorant about you know, most foreign currency. <laughs> but 500 sounds like a lot. Thank you so much. Roger, 20 bucks. I uh, greatly appreciate it, my friend. Uh, let's see. Have you ever thought about interviewing Steve Hassan? He's an expert on cults and has a great impact on the ex-Jehovah's Witness community. I'd like to find out more. Can you send me a link to his website or biography page? Just send it to uh, Seth at thethinkingatheist.com. And he asked if I would do a show on African atheists. Now, that's always a possibility. It's a broad topic. Uh, how would we approach that? Um, would we want to narrow that down to atheists in different parts of Africa or what atheists are up against in African superstitions and the religions that have sort of proliferated throughout Africa? How would you want to tackle that? That's a, that's a big one. Um, there was one other one I think I missed. I'm thinking about doing a live stream of... Um, oh, shit. What's the name of the game? Not, uh, I was going to try to go back. Oh, I was going to go back to Alien Isolation. Alien Isolation. Um, a million U.S. dollars. Thank you for that. Yeah, you're very kind. Thank you, Omar. DLJ is a smartass, and I know him. He's a buddy. Uh, 60 bucks U.S. Thank you for the donation. I didn't, I'm not doing the live stream just to rack in donations. Honestly, I, I needed a break. Um... Michael said, wanted to say you're an awesome person. Glad you are on YouTube. You do a great thing. Thank you. I hope you will again find something you can believe in. Oh, goodness, I believe in a lot of stuff. I believe in love. I believe in self-generated purpose. I believe in uh, laughter and connection, human connection. I believe in setting goals and pursuing those goals and having dreams. I believe in uh, so much stuff. You know, I mean, just because I don't have a belief in a deity doesn't mean that I stand for nothing. I stand for a lot of things, don't you? I think we all do. Um, this is normally the part of the conversation when someone jumps in and says, well, I'm a nihilist. And then we make the big Lebowski reference. Um, freedom fighter Brandon Harris says, I love how you address the theist with a non-nonsense approach. Straight to the point, challenges of their beliefs leaves them shuddering to make up a completely irrational reply. It's an imperfect method, my friend. I mean, and there are some times that I, I engaged somebody just yesterday, I think, on Twitter just because I was looking for a distraction and they were giving me that one day you'll know my Jesus is real and until then I'll pray for you kind of a platitude. And so I just responded with some snark. And it's true, it was snarky, where um, 
think I said something along the line. I mean, I knew they weren't listening. And um, thank you, gaming, for the five. They, um, I think I responded something along the lines of, you know, I used to have a relationship with Jesus, but now he never calls. You know, just turn the screw just a little bit. And, you know, I, I really admire Jesus until the whole impregnating and unwed, unwed teenager with himself for the purposes of ritual sacrifice to save me from the hell that he created. That was kind of a problem. Those types of responses, they, uh, they have their uses. Mockery has its uses out there. But um, uh, let's see. Is there a third book? I guess Ghost Stories qualifies. I have another one in my skull <laughs> that I'm working on the idea for, but uh, you know, you can't force it. The minute you force it, you just end up throwing the whole thing in the wastebasket and starting over. Dragon, thank you for the donation. Would you agree that many political ideologies are becoming like religions if they have purity tests and zealots? I think it goes far beyond politics. I think you can you can hold a, a conviction about almost anything, and you can have a zeal that is almost religious. Um, and you can place these very impractical purity tests in place, tests that very, very few outside yourself and a select one or two other people might pass, and uh, then declare all others either fakes or frauds or complicit or enablers or Nazis. And uh, the good news is on line on social media, I am starting to see a little bit of a, a, a course correction. People are getting fed up. And I think a lot of people are getting fed up. And they're, they're tired of being told uh, that, uh, you know, by other people what they are. And um, they're tired of watching other people thump, you know, pound their chest. And, and um, oh, how do I phrase this? I don't know, try to lessen others to appear larger, you know. How did you and your parents come to an understanding, Jordan asks. We don't have an understanding. We spoke. Last month I was over near their house and we sat down and we paid them a visit and spoke for a, um, about 30 minutes and it was pleasant. There was only one passive-aggressive little jab from mom about the um, something about evolution. I don't know. She always has to throw one little aside out. Like she, if she doesn't, she feels like she hasn't done her due diligence as a believer. Um, and we haven't spoken since. We really don't speak. We don't really have a relationship. Mine is not the model for a successful relationship between an atheist activist son and religious parents. You know, we're cordial on the surface when we see each other, but there's a lot of damage done. Uh, insecure Kid said, Matt Dillahunty did a debate with Jordan Peterson a month ago. Jordan asked Matt why he thought he was valuable and worth preserving. Yeah, well, Jordan Peterson is becoming more problematic by the day. Uh, he's now promoting his daughter's website for some diet, which is like the ketosis diet on crack that said help to cure some physical ailment. There's no science behind it. And uh, so we're seeing more and more the lack of skepticism and critical thinking and credibility from Jordan Peterson. But he was making some very rudimentary and long debunked arguments against the atheist, talking about... Um, the goodness of Matt Dillahunty itself being a refutation of Matt's claim to be an atheist. You know, you, you're not really an atheist. You just think you are. This is an old school sort of a right comfort kind of a defense for religion. And Jordan, Jordan Peterson's Christianity is really a wild sort of a, a soup of ingredients that include Christianity and other religions and deism. And he's all over the place. So, uh, I think he's self-canceling more and more and more. Diane, thank you so much for the donation. You as well, Roger. Um, Metal Dude said, am I doing debates with the religious apologists? Uh, not really. Um, I'd be open to having a conversation with a religious person. I'm not great at formal debate. It's not my strength. It's really not anything I enjoy. 
you know, opening statement, opening statements, rebuttal, rebuttal, uh, with the moderator in the middle, and it's all very sterile. I'm really better at sitting in a chair across from someone and just having an exchange. And so, you know, if, if it was an apologist uh, in the right circumstances, I, I might have a discussion, especially if there, was, there were other people involved. I don't think I'd waste my time one-on-one -on -one with an apologist. That's just an exercise. And that's just a, you know, that way madness lies. Uh, but if there were people to watch and listen, to absorb the ideas and the arguments presented, yeah, you know, I'm, I might have that discussion. I'd be more interested in not just talking, just real people. Uh, Mr. Dave, thanks for the discussion. I know there are strings attached to the broadcast. He's referring to a string that was on my caller during the last live stream, which actually that segment took on a life of its own. People were hashtagging, save the string, cut the string, uh, no strings attached. It was just one pun after the other. And it's amazing the stuff that, you know, online people who can have the perspective that I do, that I do not, rather, I couldn't see it. Um, they just became, it took on a life of its own. Unholy Trinity Tour, you, Matt, and Aaron. I think that's a one shot. I think that was just a one off. We had uh, the, the American Tour, we did uh, Australia, three cities. But I think. I think we've put that one to bed. I think we're good being activists. We, you know, we speak together, but as far as unholy trinity, probably for me that was it was an an amazing and wonderful experience. But I, I think we're good. Bradley asked if I remember being crippled by the thought of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Absolutely, unforgivable sin is terrifying. Now, and it's interesting now looking back because the unforgivable sin isn't the rape of a child. You know, it's not murder. The unforgivable sin is hurting the feelings, essentially, or, or uh, grazing against the thin skin of a supposedly omnipotent God by blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And I have had occasions in my life when I have seen a believer who lived in that kind of fear. And only on certain occasions, but I, I will do it in their presence. I will just say, uh, I'm not afraid. And they'll say, well, you should be. And I'll say, I'm not afraid. Well, you should be. And I'll say, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And the look on their face is just one of terror. And they just tilt. Because to them, I've condemned myself. There's now no forgiveness. You cannot come back from that. And in my mind, I'm like, look, you, you, know, you can scare me with hell about as much as you can scare me with Lord Voldemort, you know. And it's a liberating place to be. It took me a while to get there. Blasphemy now is it's kind of fun. <laughs> you know, blasphemy now is um, it's an exercise in liberation, showing to other people that we are not afraid. You know, you're going to burn the Koran? Go ahead. If you want to uh, put up that meme where Jesus is hanging on the cross, nailed to the cross, and the caption says, not going anywhere, try a Snickers. Go ahead. And blasphemy is fun. Uh, my spouse is a believer, Jordan said. Mine is very much so. We have a truce, but wondering how you and Natalie worked it out. Well, Jordan worked it out is has a finality to it. It's It's work all the time. It's one day, you know, I, she doesn't want the spotlight. You know, some people have wondered why they don't see more of her than they do occasionally in photographs. And, you know, this is not her deal. Michael, thank you for the donation very much. The, um, let me see how to phrase this. I won't share anything that I don't think she, uh, she would want me to forgive the pause. I need to gather my, my own mind on this. So if she was a fundamentalist Christian, we'd never work. I'll admit that outright. I mean, if she was as much of a Christian as I am, an atheist activist, there's no way. Uh, and I'm the first to admit that. Uh, she is more of a, a casual Christian who... Um, She's really more of a deist sometimes than a Christian. Uh, 
our challenges come with the way we approach the world. And let me I'm back up by saying that, that I married her for a reason. Uh, Natalie is, she's the most beautiful person I know. She is um, a person of tremendous beauty and generosity and, and she's my soft place to fall and, and I'm, I try to be hers, you know. Um, but we are very different and those differences sometimes make it such a challenge. It, it seems to go like a sine wave, you know, you've got your, your peaceful times and then pressure will build at certain moments in a relationship. And this is probably true with all relationships where, um, you know, you are more and more acutely aware of your differences. And it bothers you more on some days than it does on other days. And um, where I'm a crusader, you know, uh, we're, we're on the couch watching television. And I'll see something about a cult or not even a cult. You know, oh, Jesse Duplantis is asking his followers for $50 million for his fourth private jet. Well, to her, it's, it just goes and just rolls right by because it, it's not her sandbox. She's doing other things. She cares about other things. And um, I'm about to come out of my skin. $50 million for a jet because Jesse Duplantis doesn't want to make layovers. This guy's a scam artist and people are, you know, they're enabling this and he's bilking people out of their money and often promising them blessings in the afterlife and he's a crook and blah, blah, blah. And I'm about to just, and this happens to me all the time. Gene, thank you for the donation. It, whatever the story is, I think some people are wired this way. It's a very real possibility that you are wired this way. You see an unjust thing happen, and you are, you primally, you are charged. This is this this needs to be rectified. And uh, she just looks at me like you cannot fix the whole world. I know this must be fixed, you know, but you can't fix the whole world. You're right, but it doesn't mean that I don't have an opinion about these things. And uh, sometimes she just she smiles at me because this stuff really does get to me. Uh, activists like me are 24-7 because I do what I do because I'm compelled, but also because I love it. I'm always, I'm always sort of thinking about it, right? Well, that's hard. You know, when you're, you know, you're punishing yourself for all the times that you're not connecting with your audience or building the community or working on a podcast or preparing for the next video or writing the next speech or doing whatever you're doing or doing the book. Um, it's hard because, you know, she wants all of me. She wants a hundred percent of her husband. We'll go out and spend time together. Uh, it's hard. Like if she comes home early from work one day, no, this is my work day. And I, you know, even though I work from home, I'm all day. I work. I, I don't leave the studio. I'm in here all day. Occasionally I'll take a break to grab a bite or let the dogs out, grab a coffee, and then we'll game occasionally if I'm really needing a break. And, uh, you know, if she comes home early, her expectation, she's like, hey, I'm home early, let's hang. You know, you want to go do something. And I'm thinking, I've got three more hours of prep on this podcast, and I've got, I want to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I need to call Google because they got to do this, and we're going to do the ad campaign, and I've got all this other work I've got to get done, and I'm goal oriented. So until the goal is done, I have a hard time relaxing. And sometimes I have to work on compartmentalizing. I've got to take this box, the work box, and I got to put it back here to make sure that I can totally be with her and be hers. But, uh, you know, she gets weary from, from the battle from the fury of battle. Um, she'll come to the conventions occasionally and, and she'll help me work the table and she very much supports me and my right to be who I am. Unlike my mother and father, she's like, you need to be you. But she doesn't get, you know, uh, activism like this. It doesn't resonate with her. It doesn't speak to her. It just, and in some ways it does not bother her in the way that it bothers me. And that sometimes makes me crazy. And it makes her crazy that I can't let it go. You put us in the same space and these things sort of grind off each other. We have our moments. 
how do we make it work? Well, we're like any married couple with differences. We uh, sometimes, you know, things blow up and and there are raised voices. And we we had an argument just last week. Um, but it's rare that we really argue, but it was it was along those lines. It was um, it spoke to you know my values and her values and this and that and and I I just like why don't you get this like why how can you not see this through my eyes and understand why this is such a problem and why we all as moral creatures need to oppose this? And she's like, you know, this is not what I do, right? And then I get frustrated because she's not morally outraged and because it doesn't matter, you know, and the indoctrination of children and all these other things, blah, blah, blah. We just, you know, and then we come back afterwards and we, we say our apologies and we hold each other and we tell each other how much we love each other and we... And we, uh, we are reminded of all the good that we have in our lives. And uh, we start again from that square and move forward. So, I mean, I, probably every married couple or most married couples have these types of things, right? Sometimes you grate against each other and drive each other nuts and things come to a head. And, and then the other times are amazing and you're partners and you share life and make memories and have goodness. And, um, but d- don't, you know, don't ever think it's, it's a cakewalk. You have two strong personalities, different personalities, doing things differently in the same space. Sometimes, you know, you're going to have those roadblocks and you got to somehow get past them. Uh, forgive the long answer, but um, I mean, that, I mean, that's the activist in me. I just sometimes I'm, I want everybody to join hands with me and let's go get them, you know, and um, and those who are not wired for that. I have sometimes I have a hard time processing that. And, um, but overall, I mean, you know, I, she is, I don't see her, I don't see Natalie and see Christian. I see Natalie, I see person. Uh, Dragon in the West, how do you feel about the legalization of cannabis and prostitution? Do you think it's being held back in the name of, supposed name of morality and God by those who don't like it? Yeah, I'm in Oklahoma. Are you kidding? They just passed medical marijuana. And Governor Mary Fallon, who is a huge theocrat, and panders to the religious right, had a shit fit over it. So she was trying to put all these restrictions on it that you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that. And then she was informed, I believe, by our attorney general that she could not do that. But to the cannabis fight, the marijuana, the medical marijuana, and recreational marijuana fight here in the Bible Belt is going strong. And that battle, of course, is going to result in the legalization of weed, but only after it's sort of torn from the fingers of these you know, these blue law moral majority types who want to tell other people how to live. Oklahoma, you know, I'll tell you, it's not a bad place to live. We take a lot of heat for being Oklahoma, but sometimes we deserve the heat. (laughs) Sometimes we deserve to be ridiculed. Sometimes we are just the last to the party. You know, us in Mississippi and Arkansas Maybe uh, there's, I think maybe one of them. We just seem to always be like, we're, education, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, when it comes to the passing of laws and, and you know, the Ten Commandments statues, and, oh, God. Prostitution, now, you know, when I was a, a devout believer, I used to give a shit. And now, I mean, my concerns about prostitution aren't about the uh, being a sex worker itself. They are linked more to... Um, those who are co-opted into sex work or those who are who resort to it and in a dangerous way, perhaps even coerced into it because of some sort of a, a familial societal or cultural force. Uh, so that's not an easy one to answer. But on the surface, if somebody wants to be a sex worker, I don't give a shit. I just, you know, if it is something of you're doing of your own volition, and you have a, a fully cognizant, you know, grasp on what the implications are. That's your choice. It's your body. Now, you know, if you'd have told me 15 years ago I'd have that position, I'd have thought you were nuts. I just thought you were crazy. And here I am. Voted for weed in June during the primaries. Voted for weed. And if they, if they put recreational weed on, I mean, I don't even smoke weed. Uh, if they put it on the ballot, recreational weed, which they may for November during the midterms, sure, 
People are smoking it anyway. Everybody who wants weed has it anyway. I think it's stupid that people should be in jail for marijuana. It's stupid that booze is legal and weed is not. That's just crazy. It's just some arbitrary thing that is in place, mostly because of these moral majority types. It's stupid. The huge double standard. It's a waste of law enforcement resources. Quite frankly, if you want to go... And, and the medical benefits for like cancer, why would someone dying of cancer be denied medical marrow, be denied anything. You're in amazingly horrible pain. And we're busy sitting on our hands going, ah, it's immoral to give that person drug X. And I just think to myself, and actually the moral thing is to alleviate the pain, to manage the pain, to give them some quality of life. And if that means some illegal substance, they're dying of cancer for Pete's sake. Kai, thank you for the donation. Greatly appreciate it. It's, it's bizarre. You know, I, I remember when I was a, a fundamentalist, I heard Alan Dershowitz, the famous attorney, talking about how all drugs ought to be legalized to take the crime out of it. And I thought he was nuts. And now I'm like, I don't know if all drugs ought to be legalized. I'm not there. I don't. You know, I'm still, I still struggle with you know, PCP, LSD, heroin. I don't know. I don't know where I'm at. I, I can't figure that one out. But uh, marijuana is an easy one, right? Marijuana is an easy one. And if we're going to oppose the drugs, at least let's make sure we're doing so from a basis, from a mindset, from a standpoint of uh, the law and morality based in like a secular culture or in, in humanity and not because some holy book talks about uh, you know, how we should live morally or some pastor is pounding his pulpit telling people what they can and cannot do. Justin, thanks for the donation. Resident Evil Biohazard. Is Resident Evil a horror game? I know it's a horror game. Is it just a horror game or is it an action game? Because I'm crap at shooters. I have no reflexes. I have the reflexes of the three-toed sloth. And so when I go into an active shooter situation, you know, where I'm... I said active shooter is a way... I didn't mean like active shooter. When I go to a, a shooting game, a first-person shooter game, um, I, haven't, I don't think I've played a, a first-person shooter since Counter-Strike. I would... I would um, spawn into the game environment i'd have enough time to like turn the mouse once and i'd get sniped by somebody who plays the game 24 7 who's probably a third my age i just never played again so if it's a shooter probably out but if it's more of an immersive environment where you can get into it and there's you know there's some thinking involved some puzzles to solve some environments to enjoy more than just the pulling of a trigger against the are they demons that were i'm fighting or are they some sort of an undead horde. Um, what am I fighting in Resident Evil? Is it uh, little devils? I, I, I'm enjoying the sacrilegious games a little more. Uh, Outlast 2 is a great example, going up against the hillbilly cult. Big fun to go up against these guys. And there's tons of sacrilege. The upside-down crosses and the virgin sacrifices, and they're impregnating them with demons. I think they're demons. And they've got all these horrible things that when I was a believer, I used to, I'd be wigging out. There is a game out. Oh, forgive me. There is a game out called Agony. I haven't played it. I've been waiting on the reviews to come in before I buy it. It's a journey into hell. And in the past, the hell-based games that I have seen that have included a, a vision of hell or environments, virtual environments of hell, are pretty basic. They're red, and there's some smoke and fire. And you'll hear some screaming. But, I mean, it's just not immersive. Agony, I saw the trailer on YouTube last year when the game was still in development. It released a month ago. It's hardcore. It is detailed and dark. And it's like Clive Barker's Hellraiser meets... God, I don't even know who to mesh that with. Little David Cronenberg in there. Some Todd McFarlane. Uh, it's... Go to YouTube and look for Agony Video Game Trailer or Agony Game Trailer. It's dark. And that kind of thing actually interests me because now I can play them 
without that, all that supernatural baggage. And just like blasphemy, it's liberating to be able to to go to hell and see the demons and the tormented and the and perhaps you even see Satan himself. And you know, it's it's you are suspending disbelief willfully. Uh, like you would in an amusement park, and you're not thinking about the spiritual ramifications of dancing with the devil and participating in this sort of demonic gamesmanship and supporting a company that would ever produce such blasphemous material agony. You can play it as an atheist and just play it for the hell of it, if you'll pardon the expression. I got to look back and see if I've missed anything important here on the chat room. Please forgive me. Uh, as I try to browse just a little bit. <laughs> Justin says uh, Resident Evil 7 is pretty much just horror. The reviews for it are through the roof, so I'd be interested in playing. Um, how does the original... Dusty, how does the original Resident Evil look today? I mean, has it passed the test of time? Is it too dated to really enjoy Ayla says, never been able to catch a live podcast. Thank you for all that you do. I've been a viewer for a long time. You've helped me a ton in my abandonment of religion. Thank you. Well, thank you, honestly, for the encouragement you bring me by being here and participating. You know, the Thinking Atheist community was actually my first attempt to reach out to find others who didn't think I was nuts. I mean, in Oklahoma, when I was coming out of my faith in 2009, I started the website as as my own attempt to try to find encouragement and people were there for me. We're here for each other, so I like the sound of that. Can I come to West Virginia? I must be invited, by the way. Um, if you ever have um, a free thought group who's interested, I usually bring out, I'm working on a great speech. I, I, have you seen my speeches? Like, like, I envy Matt Dillahunty in some ways because Matt... We were in Australia, and I think he wrote his speech on the plane. And it was fantastic. And I'm like, you fucker. Like, I've been agonizing for weeks. If you, have you seen my stuff? You can go to the Thinking Atheist YouTube page. And all my stuff, I've got like, you know, 130 high-impact, fully produced slides. I'll take them into Photoshop and layer them out with text and tags. And I'm, I've got it timed out, and I've... I know, and then I'll hone it on the road. You know, I'll give the speech and go, this didn't work as well, and i got to change this, and I'll, and I'll tour with it for a, a, maybe a couple of months. And, and uh, I spend so much time on them. And I'm working on one now that deals with sort of unskepticism, for lack of a better word, and how the idea that just because we're atheists doesn't mean we're immune to bad ideas. It doesn't mean that we're, we're immune to being manipulated and I get into some very popular stories where many people in the atheist movement and beyond, in the culture as a whole, were totally led over the cliff. And they wigged out and lost their minds over something that they did not have all the information about. And when the information comes to light, it totally changes the story. And you're like, well, I was never given this information. But beyond that, the story is, I, you know what, I didn't do any digging to verify the information. Some of this is on me, right? And uh, so I'm working on that. I'm up to slide number 65, um, and I'm going to pound away at it for another you know, couple of weeks, and I'll take it out on the road in September. But uh, if you're ever, ever interested in having it, it, the speech is fun. The, speech, the speeches I give are designed to be audience pleasers, but the speeches are not the big attraction. Uh, if I come out, really, the big part of the day is where we hang out afterwards. And uh, we just chill. We'll swap stories, take pictures, connect. If somebody wants something signed, I'm honored to be able to do that. Though That's fun. That's And a lot of the, especially in the Bible Belt states, again, these people have only churches around them. Having an atheist-type event for them is like, you know, an oasis in the desert, you know. So, um uh, but the free thought group has to invite me and then we'll look at the calendar and, and, um, you know, I ain't trying to get rich doing this. I just normally ask, they cover my expenses and if they want to do a, an honorarium, great, but whatever. Duke Nukem 3D, Dave, there's a memory. 
and I refused to play the uh, sequel because it was in development for eternity, and they still said it sucked. <laughs> they still said it sucked. Um, let's see. Where do I live? I'm in Oklahoma, silent witness. I will be in Florida in November. Details are at sethandrews.net. Click the speaking tab. You'll see the dates that I have listed there. And those that have secured venues and times and uh, whatnot, that they'll be added as they come in. Uh, there are a few that I think say details coming soon because uh, we're still waiting to find out what the venue is going to be, what the address is going to be. Um, Nick says, not trying to stereotype everyone. Doesn't it seem odd most fundamental evangelical Christians are Republicans or worse, Trump loyalists. They hate the poor, unlike Jesus. Well, we agree about the first part. Fundamental evangelical Christians here in the United States are largely Republicans. We disagree that they all hate the poor. Um, some do, or perhaps more a more sinister way to say it would be they discount the poor. They pity the poor in the abstract. I feel sorry. Lord, bless the poor. But they have no desire to go out and try to alleviate the suffering of the poor or to take food to the hungry or, or provide resources for those who have none or few. And uh, that's, that's a challenge. And, and there are others who are fundamentally religious who are genuinely charitable and kind and good. Uh, their model for charity and kindness and goodness is damaged by magical thinking, but they genuinely do care about the poor. And I think we have to fairly make that observation or make that declaration. Uh, Fury at Arms, in 2005, when my oldest child was in foster care, I was in the process of leaving faith behind, dabbling in Wicca. I've been thinking about doing a show on Wicca for the October podcast. Um, it's kind of a broad subject, but I'm interested in it. And uh, so we may cover Wicca. I'm going to get killed, too, because there's so many brands and flavors. And the minute we say something about Wicca over here, someone who practices Wicca differently is going to come after me and say that I misrepresented Wicca. Um, but I'll do my best to be fair. Expect to show on Wicca coming up in the month of October. Will I do a, tw a Twitch stream later? I'll do my very best, probably sometime in the afternoon. Uh, let me make sure I have uh, done due diligence and got everybody. Anyone else have a comment or question? I'll only do this as long as it's entertaining and engaging for you. Do you like this format? Just me blathering on with the chat room, scrolling by. Do you engage with this? It's you know an alternative to the Blog Talk Radio switchboard, which I've long lamented as being problematic. It's just a problem. It, and and they know it. They did an upgrade of their software, but it's far from perfect. And um, so doing the live switchboard, the live radio shows, it, it's just hard. It, it's easier to hook up on Google Hangout or to perhaps connect here. Um, but, I mean, do you like this? Does it, you know, scratch the itch for you? Does some people listen while they do other things? So if they are... Uh, you know, if they're out working or if they're driving or if they're doing something else, I mean, you tell me. Uh, let's see. What else in the chat room? Let's scroll down. My astrology sign? Uh, I think I'm in Aries, April 12th. I did a chapter on astrology in my book, Sacred Cows which shows some interesting stuff about astrologies and uh, astrological signs. and well, It's funny, people who read the astrology section of a paper or book or website, you know the question they never ask is, who wrote that? I mean, they'll just read the prediction. You know, Today is not a good day to engage with strangers as uh, blah, blah, whatever the, you know, the prediction is. And... No one says, thank you, Dragon, for the donation. No one says, <laughs> says uh, who wrote this? What are their qualifications? They just read, 
And so what, if you read the astrology section of like your local newspaper and then you open People magazine and they have an astrology section, which they might, and then if you go to a website, astrology.whatever, and you read that, do the Aries predictions for any given day line up or are they all different? Well, I would suspect they're all different or they're nebulous enough that they, that they can sort of be molded into each other. I mean, we're, people who are supposedly skeptical about uh, so many things and they'll just read the, uh, the astrology sign. They have no idea who wrote it. Like, who, who wrote it? Is it somebody back in the mailroom? Is it somebody's, you know, college student kid who came in and just hammered it out? Is it, did they grab it from another place? Randy and Thendis, thank you so much. Uh, have I tried Far Cry 5 or Doom? Not the latest. I played the old school Doom. I was a huge fan of Quake 1 and Quake 2. Played Quake 3, thought it was okay. Not a big fan of the multiplayer. I prefer a linear story. Um, why do Christians think God had a plan for the Christian artist Rich Mullins, who was violently killed in a car wreck? Why do they think God has a plan when a child dies of leukemia? I honestly think they are attempting to create a happy ending that does not exist. It's their way of dealing with coping. It's, it's the creation of a fantasy in order to cope with reality. And I, I don't think it's... I understand it, but I'd, I'd like to see us get past it. Um, you should involve other people online. Is that possible? Can I? I don't think I can. Um, like, I don't think my camera only feeds YouTube. I can't feed Skype and YouTube at the same time with this software. I don't think. But it, you know, it'd be cool to get somebody else and we could field stuff together. I'm still really getting used. I just now got all the uh, the the settings together for the live stream for me. So I'd have to go and learn a little bit more. Uh, Myers-Briggs personality test. Nathaniel, I have done some uh, reading about it. If anyone ever asks you to take Myers-Briggs, and I've seen employers give Myers-Briggs to their employees, beware, it's total bullshit. It's, it's not effective. Um, Sonia said, I used to work for a newspaper. The horoscopes used to be taken from a magazine and typed, and we got some free ones. They tried eliminating them, but they were simply too popular. What does that say about us? It's a newspaper. It's a newspaper. Newspaper. Text from my bride. Hang on just a second. All right. I have about an hour to the ice cream, man. We'll go another few minutes here. No, I'm not tech savvy. I get your sarcasm there. Uh, I'm good at using the interface. I'm, go I'm not good at, uh, at why and how. Like, um, I take advantage every day of computers, but if I had to build one or repair one, I, uh, I, the last time I tried it, <laughs> I had my old Alienware computer. had an, a liquid cooling system in it, and I was trying to replace... I think it was the uh, processor chip. Am I saying that right? And before it was over, I had spilled liquid all over the carpet in my office. And it was at that moment the, the realization came to me that I should play to my strengths and contact, contract out my weaknesses. And this is a good rule for most of us. Like, it's not that we can't all learn. I mean, we simply, we simply have to know our strengths and weaknesses. And so in that moment, I should have just played to my strengths, contracted out my weaknesses. Seth, give a shout out for being cited in the Supreme Court of the United States regarding the Bladensburg, Bladensburg Cross case. Hammond got a shout out in the Supreme Court ruling? I got to find that. Uh, what do I do for a living? You're looking at it. I'm a full-time activist, radio host, video producer, public speaker, author, and occasionally gamer. Mark said, I hold a resentment toward religion largely for the years of telling me fables and telling me I was not worthy. What have you heard or learned about letting go of a resentment that feels so primal? 
People ask me sometimes if I resent my mother and father for teaching me religious belief. And I don't resent them for that. They genuinely believed it. It wasn't that they were lying to me because they felt it was true. They thought they were doing the right thing. They were acting from genuine sincerity. I resent my mother and father because they don't respect my right to disagree with them as an atheist. That's a whole other conversation. I resent you know, what religion claims as it uh, says it owns. I resent how it damages people. I resent how it's so opportunistic. Go after young kids and people in the vulnerable places in their lives. I, I resent the fact that it's so often co-opted by politicians. Um, I, I resent, you know, I resent time wasted. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we can sit around resenting it or we can go out and try to help people escape it. Kiri, thank you for the donation. There's a f- top five personality traits test. We used to see it. There were four, I think, in the personality test that I had been raised with. Let's see. There was the choleric, which is a type A personality. That's the doer, uh, the person who charges into the room. Melancholy, this, this is the um, person who doesn't like the spotlight. They're kind of shy. They're very meticulous and orderly in nature, borderline OCD. There is the, um, oh, crap. Phlegmatic, that's the person who is kind of uh, almost lazy, you know, no ambition, you don't want to do or be anything. Um, you just kind of let life pass you by. What's the fourth? Starts with an S. You are the buoyant personality. You've never met a stranger. You walk into the room and in five minutes you know everybody. Shit, what is that personality? There's choleric, phlegmatic, melancholy, and choleric, phlegmatic, melancholy. This is not going to drive me crazy. Does anybody know these, or is it just me? I got to look it up. Sanguine. Libra, thank you for that. I was going to be three in the morning, and I was going to be staring at the ceiling going, like, man, I can't remember. Sanguine, yes. The sanguine personality comes in, and they're buoyant and all personality and ebullient and full of life and zest and verve, and they, they've never met a stranger, the sanguine person. So uh, I don't know where those come from. DLJ said they're the four humors. I don't know what they're rooted in. They were just taught to us as you can see, you can, they, we were taught, and I don't know how much truth is in this. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm ignorant of it. But we were taught that there were four, not by my family. I forgot where I learned this, but I was young. Uh, there were four basic personality types. And then some people are a mix. So you could be... Um, you know, part of this, you could be part sanguine, but also part choleric type A, meaning you're an ebullient, outgoing person, but you're also a hands-on doer who gets goals accomplished, you know. And you can mix all these up in the recipe of human personality. Um, Adam asked if I'd be willing to do a video of my reading of the ultimate question. You're talking about the letter at the end of the speech I gave. Somebody already did a version, a YouTube video, where... They set that letter, my reading of it, like an eight-minute reading of the letter to music and put visuals on it and released it to YouTube. I had no idea they had done it until they had done so. And, you know, I try not to be too awfully proprietary about segments of my stuff being grabbed and used. And this was one of those instances where I was just honored and delighted. Normally, when somebody steals my stuff, I'm like, sorry, go make your own. Uh, but in this instance, when they grabbed it and, and set it to music, I was tremendously honored. It was touching to see what they had done with it. And I have considered going back and taking that to the next level, taking a reading of the letter, uh, which is essentially talking about how your life belongs to you and, and it's okay to be different and, and um, you know, your life has value and, and you're beautiful and those types of things. And creating my own sort of a graphics and music package around it and, and releasing it. It's possible. Um, it's possible. Bjorn, thank you for the donation. 
What type of people do you hire if you have a cherry orchard? I don't get it. Am I just slow of wit? <laughs> Am I just slow of wit? It's very possible I might just be slow of wit. Um, okay, was there anything else before we... Uh, I mean, I don't know how long you like to, these things to go. Oh, look, now I've got... Let me show you this. Natalie got me a um, a gear watch. All right. My watch is asking me if I would like to do squats. It's saying, you have been seated. You have been inactive for a certain length of time. Is that going to autofocus? I don't know if you can see it or not. Uh, it's still focused on my face. Forgive me. Would you like to do squats? Hell no, I'm not going to do squats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do squats. I would maybe go for a walk. Um, it's funny. Um, I, I really do. I was wondering if having the, being able to get texts and whatnot on my phone and phone calls, or rather on my watch, would be a, um, be like a ball and chain. And the opposite has proven true. Because now when a text comes through, I don't have to drop everything and go grab my phone to see if it's something I need to respond to. I can just look down and, oh, there it is. And uh, I don't use this for email, really. It's not practical for me. Uh, occasionally when somebody calls, I'll actually answer it on my watch and we'll talk. It's kind of James Bondish to do so. But uh, having said that, um, the apps are okay but not amazing. The Samsung Gear actually feels more like a beta test than an actual final product. If you want, uh, if you want a great smartwatch, Natalie got the Apple Watch. It's a far superior product, and I don't even like Apple. I mean, as far as their phones, it's, they're just way too proprietary for me. I want more flexibility to be able to do what I want to do. I, Apple's fine, I get it, but but I have to admit the Apple Watch is such a superior product and so many more apps that work correctly. Their speech to text is spot on. She can just click a button and she can say something and it actually prints out and, and it's what she said. You try that with this watch and it looks like someone put whatever you said into a language translator and then translated it back and then translated into a second language and translated it back. The words make no sense. They come together in no particular order. It's so impractical, I don't even use it. And there's a ton of people bitching about their speech to text on forums all over the world. They're like, this is shit, and they're absolutely right. Um, have I done a video about grief? I lost both of my parents in the last three months. Jeffrey, I'm sorry for the loss of your mom and dad. Uh, we've done podcasts about it. Um see the names of those and you can art you can look in the archive at blogtalkradio.com i think it's grief beyond belief or grieving without god um or you can just go to the thinking atheist and scroll back we've done some shows that deal extensively with how do we grieve as people who don't believe we'll see our loved ones again in heaven and um to talk about how those people in some ways do live on in us and uh, maybe that'll help you uh, i would also um encourage you is the is the website grief beyond belief let me look grief beyond belief dot org see if that's it dan has asked while we're waiting about the loss of christopher hitchens and what do i feel it's done to the community of non-believers I think it is. No, that's not it. What's the name of that website? I've talked to Rebecca Hensler how many different times? Um, atheist Grief. Let's see what pops up here. Griefbeyondbelief.org Yeah, all right. It came up. Griefbeyondbelief.org and they have uh, resources. You can contact them for uh, more information. And um, that would be, you know, they've got everything about uh, funerals. They've got um, uh, 
uh, personal stories, talk about the loss of babies and young children, advice for people getting through, the psychology of grief, uh, those who deal with things like suicide. They've got a lot of resources there. Uh, back to Christopher Hitchens, I deal with it like I deal with the loss of any person who was influential in my life. I grieve that they are no longer with us producing new things, but I do surround myself with um, a lot of the older stuff. You know, I've got, uh, I don't know how many of his books here, and sometimes I'll look up his uh, YouTube videos just to listen to Christopher Hitchens because he just had that signature style. It was so amazing. Uh, Anne said, I need a sidekick producer who can scan and help select intelligent questions while I'm speaking. Yeah, that's true, Anne. I need somebody who can um, assist and make me more effective at this. Um, I receive your wisdom. It's, you know, it's hard sometimes to find good people, but I've, you know, I'm, and I, you know, I'm, I'm have a difficult time delegating. <laughs> That's really the problem. I'm kind of, I'm kind of a control freak. Um, all right, come on, one more. Cecilia, thanks for the donation. My take on the religious task force. <laughs> for those who aren't aware of this, Jeff Sessions just announced that they were going to do a religious task force to help ensure the protection of religious liberty in the United States. The narrative being is that essentially Christianity is under attack in the, the USA. And this is the biggest, most bullshit claim I've heard this week from a, in a strong field, in a strong field. Right. Um, and I posted, you know, somebody else was talking about, we, we talk about religious privilege all the time. Like, you know, are Christian TV stations being ripped off the airwaves? No. Are Christian Bibles being taken out of, and Books of Mormon out of the hotels, Marriott hotels or whatever? No. Are they being replaced with uh, Richard Dawkins books or science books? No. Do we see churches on every corner? Yes. Do people have the freedom to go and worship any hour of any day? Can they worship privately? Can they own religious materials? Can they put crosses on their lawns? Can they put baby Jesuses on their personal Christmas displays? Can they sing Christian songs? Can they enjoy Christian radio stations? Can they wear Christian t-shirts and crosses on their ears and around their necks? Can they be as religious as they want to be? Yes. I'll tell you what they're pissed about. They're pissed that they live in a culture where more and more people are telling them they disagree and think it's a bunch of crap. And so they call this persecution. And so they're selling this narrative that we are under attack by all them secular humanists. <laughs> yeah. Who come, they're coming after us. We, 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 it's a war. It's a war on Christianity. Well, in some ways, perhaps, it's a war on the idea of Christianity because we consider it a long debunked and bad idea. But it's not a war on your right to believe or practice your faith. And that's the bullshit that they're selling. And so this is just smoke and mirrors to help give Christianity more privilege in the United States. It is something we must speak out against. We must remind everybody again here in the USA that Christians have more freaking latitude than pretty much any other religion, possibly on any other place except for a radical Islamic country. <laughs> you know, they, they can be as Christian as they want to be uh, with as long as they're protecting the church state line, and they even crossed that line. You know, they the churches are still participating politically, and they're and they're influencing their congregations as to who to vote. And they're they've got the ear of Donald Trump. You got Franklin Graham, who has the ear of Donald Trump. Don't tell me that you're that you are being persecuted in this country. So that's my take on the religious liberty task force. I don't know. You know, I'm I'm hoping for some rationality. Uh, sometimes I speak like I'm in a Bible study. Thank you for that. <laughs> Somebody told me once I speak like a pastor. I think it's because I, the cadence of a storyteller and a lot of pastors are storytellers. Um, I guess that's all I got today. Uh, please know that, uh, the connection I have with you in this community and being reminded, even reading the chat, uh, lines is massive for me to to know that not everybody out there is Jeff Sessions who's uh, selling all this craziness. Not everybody is Ken Ham is celebrating his getting into his third year of the Ark Encounter. Not everybody is is uh, rounding up people and trying to cocoon them from opposing ideas and that uh, community and goodness and purpose and love and joy and connection like this exists far beyond the church, and we, we can enjoy it as human beings, as free thinkers, as rationalists, as atheists. And it, 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 it's, it's oxygen for me. It helps me to do what I do. It helps keep me kicking. 
And uh, so for those who donated, thank you for the uh, support. Again, I'm trying to fund a little bit of an ad campaign to try to get my book out next month. You're not obligated to help, but for those who felt like they wanted to toss in a few bucks, huge. And uh, it's greatly appreciated because I really do want to see it succeed after all the time. Hundreds and hundreds of hours in the production room over the years that I've put into uh, the book. Even though it's not an atheist book, I'm hoping that it will help me support what I do and also bring in a, a fresh set of eyes and ears, a whole new audience who's interested and curious about these secular people and what they're about. So, And if you want to donate, you can do so at thethinkingatheist.com or just go to, uh, yeah, I think thethinkingatheist.com will work. But uh, I appreciate you all, and I will uh, be in touch. And I'll try to do a, a game stream maybe later on this afternoon. So keep an eye on the uh, social media pages. I'll see you then.